So my wife uh, works at Teen Hope Ministries. I don't know if any of you know K- Gary Kadansky, but uh, uh, she works uh, with him. And uh, a couple of weeks, a few weeks back, she brought home a big box of peaches. Okay, because that's what they do for their fundraising is they sell peaches. And uh, and at, I'm I'm you know I'm in this I'm in this new way of living, this new lifestyle of eating. I I lost a bunch of weight and I don't want to get it back on, right? And uh, so I avoid a lot of sugar. Um, in fact, I even avoid a lot of fruit because fruit has a lot of natural sugar in it. I mean, it's good for you, but at the same time, there's still sugar in it. And when you're trying to lose weight, you got to avoid it. But when she brought that home, it was a big box of peaches that would have gone bad had I not helped, right? So I, <laughs> so I enjoyed these peaches. And if you've ever been in a phase in your life where you've just been saying no to sugar and you take a bite into a good piece of fruit, you know what that's like. It's like, it's like dessert, Right? And these were like Colorado-grown, just beautiful pieces of fruit, and uh, I had the joy of uh, devouring a bunch of those. It was, it was lovely, right? I mean, and you just know a good piece of fruit takes work, okay? It doesn't just happen. We can't just force it, right? Like, you, you can do things and hope for the best results. Uh, when I was growing up, my parents uh, planted a bunch of trees around our house, and they uh, they wanted. They picked them based on what they what the adult tree would look like, and you know they're like, let's have some different colors in our in our yard for fall and that kind of stuff, right? So they planted these trees, and one of them that they planted was a non fruit bearing peach tree, right? And uh, you can imagine because they they, they wanted the non fruit bearing because if you have a fruit bearing tree, you understand it's a lot of work, and it can make a mess, right? If you don't take care of it. It'll just drop its fruit, and it just makes a nasty mess. They didn't want that, so they got non-fruit-bearing trees, right? Well, you can imagine their dismay then when they saw peaches starting to bud on this thing, right? But as the tree grew, that first, that first time that it started to produce fruit, the branches started to bend like they were going to break under this fruit because they were the biggest peaches we'd ever seen in our lives, we couldn't believe it. This non-fruit-bearing tree was producing some incredible... And, and when it came time for them to be ready to come off, we pulled them off, and we bit into these things, and they were the best peaches we've ever had out of a non-fruit-bearing p- peach tree, right? And, uh, and so we recognized the fruit that we had not earned. It had just happened. But we also recognized we wanted it to happen again. And so my parents did a lot of work on making sure they knew how to take care of the soil around the tree, went to make sure it had enough water. We lived in southeastern Colorado, which is almost desert-like sometimes. So they made sure it was getting enough water. They made sure it was supported because, once again, when that thing would grow, it was like it would, it would almost kill itself with its own fruit, right? So they took care of it in that way, and they pruned it. They made sure that you know they, they would cut off certain branches to make sure that the, the peaches coming out of the branches had the best kind of uh, intake of the nutrients, all that kind of stuff, and they just cultivated some amazing peaches, right? And it took a lot of hard work, but every year we had this wonderful result of their labor. And each year, it's kind of like, well, is it going to happen again? Because supposedly this thing isn't supposed to make fruit. And yet it kept coming, right? And it came from some good work. Regardless of what we did, it produced this great fruit. Now, as a Christian, okay, so I'm talking, if you're a Christian, if you don't know where you stand with God, you don't have to worry about, this message isn't really going to, might not, you're off the hook today, okay? That's what I'm just saying. But if you're a Christian, the question that we should ask ourselves consistently is, what kind of fruit is my life producing? Have you ever seen someone try to fake happiness? Okay, yeah. Okay, have you ever seen someone try to tell themselves that they have peace when obviously they have anxiety? Okay, we can't force good fruit in our lives. We just can't. Often, good fruit of a Christian's life is the result of something else, okay? Now, Paul calls it in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, so it's only something that he can do in your life. And so today, we're going to talk about what does it take for a believer to produce good fruit in their lives? How do we make good things? Because a lot of people show up to church on Sundays because they want to be a better person, I want to be a better person. I want to love people better. I want to serve more. Like, and if I go to church, they're going to help me be a better person. Now, the truth is, 
Because that, that's, that's not actually my job. It's, my job is not to make you a better person. My job is to introduce you to the one who can. And so today we're going to look at a story in particular of what Jesus does when someone makes a mistake, but how he wants to produce fruit in their life and how he does that. Someone who's messed up, someone who doesn't deserve to have good fruit in their life, what he does so that that person pr can produce good fruit. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God one more time to bless what we're about to do because God's word has the power to transform our lives. And if you want that transformation, if you recognize I want that fruit in my life, pray with me now and ask God to open our hearts and minds for this, okay? God, we love you and we thank you. And we have a chance now to read your word. I pray that it would transform us. That your Holy Spirit inside us and the power of your word in front of us would create a transformation, that it would restore us. God, we want to see great fruit from our lives. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do the work that, re that is required. The, root that, the, the work that, we're, that works at the root of our issues, of our sin, of our troubles, of our fears. God, I pray that you would do a work there so we can see good fruit. Thank you for this example that we have now through Peter and your son. I pray that we would learn well. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John starting verse 21. So if you have your Bibles, you can flip over to John 21. If not, it'll be on the screen behind me. Now, we have been in a series for four years called He Changed Everything, right? That Jesus, when he came to this earth, man, he just, like, he rewrote the, the book on what we thought the law meant, right? He, he brought a whole new understanding of what, who God is and how he sees us and what this is like. Like, he just, he changed everything. Right? He changes our understanding of how, uh, how we see ourselves, of how we interact with others. Like That's what God wants to do. Okay? And, and so um, as we read this, I want you to be aware that God wants to reshape your thinking of yourself, your rethinking of others, and he wants to change that because we're about to see him invest in the life of someone he wants to change. Okay? Right now here we, in the story where we are is that this is after the resurrection, Jesus has just sat down to have a meal next to the lakeside with his disciples, and he's about to have a tough conversation with Peter, okay? Now, the tough conversation is coming because of what happened in Mark 14, 27 through 31. Let me read that to you right now. This is, now, this part that I'm about to read, this is Jesus before the cross. This is Jesus at, at when, when, actually, he sat down and gave the Lord's Supper. This is what he says. He says, you will all fall away. That's a great, isn't that encouraging? You're all going to fall away. Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said. Today, yes, today, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Everyone else said the same thing, but Peter's story is recorded, right? He follows Jesus after he's arrested, and while Jesus is being tried and having the snot beat out of him, people come to Peter and say, aren't you, aren't you with him? He says, no, I'm not. No, no, I'm not with him. They say, no, no, you talk like his followers. Like, you're from Galilee. You're, you're with him. No, I'm not. I'm not. And the third time they come to him and say, no, I know. I know you're one of his followers. And he calls down curses on himself. Like, may I be cursed by God if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And then the rooster crows. Okay? Peter would have heard Jesus' teaching when Jesus said, if you deny me in front of men, I will deny you in front of my father. How do you think Peter's feeling right now? Jesus is back alive. Peter is definitely overjoyed, but he's probably also going like, oh dear, I'm in trouble. Have you ever been there before? You ever been there before? Like you're thankful for Jesus, you're thankful that he loves you and you rest on that, 
but you're fairly confident that you uh, can't be used by him. I'm thankful that I'm loved, but I've messed up too badly, and uh, I think I'm disqualified. I think I'm in trouble. I I trust that God loves me, but at the end of my life, when I die, I'm still going to have that nagging question in my mind, am I going to make it into heaven? Because I've really messed up. Have you ever been there before? Because that's where Peter is right now. Again, he's probably overjoyed that Jesus is back, but there's also probably a big pit in his stomach right now because he's like, I really messed up. I disobeyed his teaching. I denied him when I said I wouldn't. He doesn't seem mad at me. That's nice. But what does this mean for my eternity? What does this mean for my usefulness? Do I even get to be a disciple anymore? Where, where do I stand with Jesus? You know what's incredible is I think that many people who go to church consistently still have those thoughts and feelings in their heart. So you ready to set the record straight? Okay. When they had finished eating, Jesus says to Simon Peter, now remember, his, his name was Simon, and Jesus gave him a new name called Peter. Okay? That's what Jesus often does in our lives. He gives us a new identity. He makes us new. The old is gone and the new has come. And he would do that sometimes by actually renaming people. Saul, Paul, Simon, Peter. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now that would have hurt. Because now Jesus wasn't calling him by his new name. He was calling him by his old name. Uh Uh-oh. That doesn't bode well for me if I'm Peter. He's not calling me Peter. He's calling me by my old name. Simon, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Now, a little under, a little behind the scenes work here. We have the word love in both of those sections. In Greek, they had different words for love. Jesus says, do you agape love me? Agape is like this selfless love, right? This unconditional love. And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo, which is like a fondness love. Notice how Jesus is saying, do you selflessly love me? And he's like, well, of course I am fond of you. That's like someone, <laughs> that's like someone finally, you know, you're in a budding relationship and it's like, okay, I'm ready to say it. I'm ready to tell them I love them. And you say, I love you. And they're like, oh, I'm fond of you. How do you think that would feel? Yes, Lord, you know that I am fond of you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt when Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Now, Jesus, verse 19 tells us, Jesus said this to indicate what kind of death Peter would uh, die to glorify God. And And then he says to Peter, follow me. First thing that... One of the first things that Jesus ever said to Simon, he says to him again, follow me. In this moment, Peter is being rebuked. But at the same time, he's also being reinstated. I know that many of us are very afraid of being rebuked by God. No one likes to be rebuked. No one likes to get talked to in that way. To be told, man, you, didn't, you, didn't, you, you messed up. You shouldn't have done it. Right, But at the same time, Jesus doesn't just rebuke him. He also moves to restoration. Here's the thing. So many people, when they come to God with their guilt and their sin, they come to him expecting some sort of rebuke. They're going to get it because they messed up, especially if you have a habitual sin that you're really struggling with, if you're addicted to something. 
You come to God and you're like, oh man, this is, it's, I mean, he's not going to accept me. Right? And so often we have this view that God is looking at us disappointed. But the thing is, is that in this moment we get to see the way that Jesus handles sinners. Okay, the way that Jesus handles sinners. And you got to know, if you are rebuked by God, he's going to follow his own rules. Okay, and you can trust that. You know what's one of God's rules when it comes to facing someone in sin? It's actually found in Galatians 6.1. It says this, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person how? With fire and brimstone preaching. With a guilt trip. With punishment. What's it say? It says, restore that person gently. I want you to go back four words. Because you got to understand, this is Jesus' goal for you, period. Jesus' goal for you is that you would be restored. This is what Jesus does to Peter. This is what Jesus does to David, a man after God's own heart who committed adultery and then murder and then tried to cover it up. Is that he didn't come just with a rebuke and punishment. He came with the purpose of restoration. That was his whole goal. Is that he saw Peter and he saw a guy with a big old mouth that often got him into trouble. I'll be the first, oh, if, even if everyone else right? Says that even if everyone else backs, uh, 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 turns their back on you, Jesus, I won't do it. I won't do it. And then that mouth gets him into trouble because three times he does it. So often it's easy to see people and just see their mistakes, and especially when you view yourself in your own mind's eye. How often, okay, how about this? Have any of you ever said, it's really easy for me to offer grace to other people. I just can't seem to offer grace to myself. Have you ever said that? Yeah, that's normal. Because when we see ourselves, it's often that all we see is our mistakes. But you've got to understand, the eyes of Christ, when he sees you, yes, he sees your mistakes. But his goal, his desire, is for restoration. That was the whole point of his ministry. The whole point was for him to come and die on the cross so that he could take the penalty of your sin and restore you to a place of righteousness. Okay, that, that when we believe in Christ, when we put our faith in Him, when we accept Him as our Lord and Savior, when we recognize, I cannot, I cannot beat my sin, I'm not good enough, I can't do this on my own, and I need someone to save me. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you are baptized, okay, He becomes sin for you, and then you receive His righteousness, which, by the way, you were created for in the very beginning. You were created in the image of a holy God, which means you were created for holiness. You were created for righteousness, for perfection. And sin is the thing that pulled us away from that. Our sin is the thing that caused death in our lives. It's like a cancer, right? And in the same way that, God, that we hate cancer in our loved one, God hates sin. But instead of just condemning us to death, he took that cancer upon himself and took the death the penalty of our sin upon himself so that we could be restored into righteousness. And when Peter breaks Jesus' own commands that if you deny me in front of others, I will deny you in front of God. When he does this, and he comes to Jesus with his head down wondering, can God use me? Am I done? He's calling me Simon, guys. He's calling me by my old name. Jesus rebukes, but he rebukes for the sake of restoration. And he says, that's what you did. Now I got some work for you to do. Let's get to work. And you know what Peter would do? Peter would. Peter would stand up and give the first gospel message. You know what else Peter would do? Peter, Peter would take a very unpopular message to the Jewish nation. Peter was the one that stood up and said, uh, guys, just so you know, Gentiles aren't unclean anymore. They're just not. Everyone is accepted in Christ. 
not just Jews. It's not for us anymore, guys. He went to the Jews with that message, a very unpopular message, by the way. Not only that, but, but Peter would die. Remember how I said that he would spread out his hands and he'd be led to a place where he didn't want to? That was a prophecy. Peter would die on a cross. He would be hung upside down, tradition tells us, because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same way that his Savior was. But Peter would die for this message. So what Jesus did was Jesus took someone who had made mistakes, who had sinned, who had messed up, not just, I mean, for crying out loud, not just once, time and time again. Instead of leaving him in a place of just, well, I love you, but I can't use you. No, he restored him. So here's what I got to say. Don't be afraid of rebukes from God, okay? If you mess up, don't be afraid. I'm going to give you one of the scariest verses in the Bible. If you're a Christian, this is one of the scariest rebukes, okay? It's found in Matthew. Matthew 7. Oh, this one's scary. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, no, not everyone who calls Jesus Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me. <laughs> if you're a Christian, that's terrifying, isn't it? That there are people who are going to stand in front of Jesus feeling, feeling fully confident that they're going to be let in to paradise and he's going to say, out of here. Isn't that terrifying? Tell you what, when I make a mistake and I think of this verse, I start playing a video game because I don't want to think about it. I'm not, I'm not lying, Right? When I think of this verse, after I've sinned, I go do something else because this is too scary for me. Because for crying out loud, I stand up every Sunday and I preach. There's probably a good many of you thinking like, man, if Jeff doesn't make it, can I make it? He's even a preacher. This is a scary rebuke. But instead of running from it, can we remember Christ's heart for every sinner for just a moment? And not run away from it, but actually dig into it. Because there's some amazing truth in here if you don't run from it in guilt. What did it say? What does it say is going to get us into the kingdom of heaven? It says, the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Oh, man. Okay, there it is, Jeff. I'm not going to make it into heaven. Because I have not done the will of my Father in heaven. I've messed up. And if that was the case, if that's all that Jesus said, Peter would be in trouble too because he did not do the will of, fa of his Father in heaven when he denied Jesus in front of man. But that's not where Jesus leaves it. Did you notice what he said? He said something very simple yet incredibly profound. They said, Lord, we did all these great things in your name. Let us in. He says, nope, get away from me. I don't what? I don't know you. I don't know you. It's not about your ability. He's, he, they're coming and saying, look at all these good things I did. Here's my resume, Je Je Jesus. Here's my resume, Jesus. Let me in. And he's looking at the resume going like, I'm sorry, you are, I don't recognize this name at the top. When Jesus restored Peter, did you notice the language he used? He said, Peter, are you going to listen to me and obey all my laws now? Is that what he said? He didn't say that. He said, Peter, do you what? Love me. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Love me. He's using relational language, not obedience language, although it's kind of the same thing. But at its heart, this is about Peter knowing Christ. 
not about his ability to make good fruit because of his goodness, because of Peter's ability to do what's good. He used relational language to restore Peter because Jesus is mainly concerned about us knowing him. So often people discredit themselves when it comes to their relation when it comes to following God based on their ability to do good or to or their inability to avoid bad. When Jesus is looking us at us saying, "Listen, <laughs> That's religion. What Jesus came to offer was relationship. And here is the truth. You start, to be, you start to act and become and talk like those you hang out with the most. You ever notice that? We are relational beings. And the fruit of our lives often comes through relationships. Think about the way that you live your life and the people that led you to living your life that way, whether by good or by negative. Most everything you do, you do because you had an example in your life that was there through relationship. Uh, Jake, uh, Jake Van Skyke, he's been here now for two-ish months, not even quite that yet. I was in the office the other day, and I reacted to something, and I said something exactly the way that he said it, and I went, whoa, I'm already starting to talk like Jake. We haven't even been around that much. We haven't even been around each other that much. But already, the influence of our relationship is having an impact on the way that I speak. Because that's what happens. We plant ourselves next to people, and the fruit of our lives often starts to look the same as theirs. And so I don't think Jesus is so concerned as if your ability to do what is right as much as you desiring him, to be with him, to be, well, I mean, we read it at communion, right? Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. I mean, for crying out loud, when these words were written, all they had were Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They had the first five books of the Bible. Have you ever read the first five books of the Bible? They are dry. You ever tried to read it? It's, it's rough, right? And yet they're saying, like, this is so good. It's like, it's like being like a tree planted next to water. When we, when we read this stuff and when we follow it, like we see God do great things in our lives. He blesses us. He watches over us. He changes us. For crying out loud, guys, we have... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is very rich and very full and beautiful. And when we plant ourselves next to Jesus, he starts to change us. Are you concerned about what you have done, or are you spending more time thinking about what he has done? Because how you answer that question will change the way you live your life. If you spend all your time thinking about what you are doing, what you have done, and what you are hoping to do, your life is going to look a certain way. But if you spend more and more and more of your time focusing on who he is, his love, and what he wants, and what he has done, your life will start to look different. Are you like a tree planted next to water producing great fruit? Or are you like so many people, distracted, focused on myself, allowing other influences in my lives to guide. And then I feel dry. And I feel like all I'm doing is making mistakes. And I feel like I'm struggling with the same sin over and over. What are you? Because guys, you can't produce fruit on your own. You have to either connect to the vine, become a card, part of God's family, spend time really focusing on Jesus and who he is, or you can try to figure out life on your own. I'm just saying, if you want the fruit, the good fruit that this life has to offer, it is going to be found in the one who created it. The author of life, the steady stream, the beginning and the end, the one who is constantly flowing, if you plant yourself next to him, then you'll start to see joy, peace, patience, all that good stuff. And one of the best ways for us to connect with Jesus is through this.
do you love your word? I mean, do you love this? Do you ache for this? Do you yearn for this? Because if you're sick of your sin, you don't realize it, but that's what you're actually really longing for. This. Because this can change us. It's incredible when I'm going through the day and I have a worry in my life and I'm, all I'm doing is thinking about myself and that worry, how my day can get ruined. But at the same time, if I'm thinking about a what if or something that I'm worried about and then I remember the promises that Jesus has given me in his word, it's incredible how my heart is stilled and the fruit of peace is provided. It's a major difference. I have a friend of mine who, uh, who has, who's, who's gone through a lot of stuff in his life and some of it's starting to catch up to him. Okay, he's a believer, he loves Jesus, he's, he's worked to change his life around, but some of this really difficult things that he's faced, like an abusive mom that would just beat him up while she was drunk, some other losses that he's had, like those are starting to catch up to him. And he's just feeling a lot of hurt. I call him up and for like two weeks, I'm like, how are you, what's going on in your life, you know, let's talk and all this. And for two weeks we're talking and I just can't seem to get anywhere with this guy. And here's the deal, guys. I'm pretty good at this, okay? Like, I'm pretty good about talking with people and helping them take next steps and, and figuring out what's going on, right? And I was frustrated, and he was frustrated because we weren't getting, getting anywhere. And then, just stupid Jeff, I just dawns on me, I just asked him a question one day. What are you reading in God's Word? Because I had assumed he was. He said, Jeff, I haven't been reading my Bible in a long time. And I'm like, well, there you go. Promise me that you'll get into your Word today. Today. And do it again tomorrow. What does your prayer life look like? Have you spent any time in prayer? No, I really haven't been spending any time. Well, God, dude, promise me you'll spend some time in prayer. Real time. Read your word and spend some time in prayer. I call him up two days later. After two weeks of frustration getting nowhere, two days later, he's a completely different man. We got a plant sitting up on top of a bookshelf. My wife admittedly says she has a black thumb, not a green one. And this is one of those, someone gave us this plant because they knew this about us. They're like, this is really resilient. And we'll watch this thing and we'll look up. It's like, oh, it's starting to die. And it's starting to wilt and it's starting to look really ugly. She'll go over there and just dump a, like a water bottle in there. And then the next day, it'll be up again. That's us. And that was him. Well, no wonder things weren't working out in his life. Because he had pulled away from the source of it. And it's incredible when he started reading his word, when he started praying, how he came alive. He hadn't been to church, and I can't tell you how long. And guess who just texted me this morning and said, I'm in church. I didn't do anything special besides say, you need this. And it changed his life. Folks, if you right now recognize you are stuck in sin, and you're not sure what else to do about it, are you in this? Are you connected to the source of life in Christ Jesus? Because if not, man, that's your first step. In your blue card, we have a next step for you. Okay, so go ahead and pull out your blue card. We got this reading plan. It's called Can God Restore Me? If you have a, if you have a smartphone, you can get to this reading plan really easy. You, go, you, you get the Bible app. You go to the bottom right-hand corner. It says more. There's a place called events, and then it says... You'll see Hope Summit Christian Church right there. Listen, if, if you come to, your head, come to God with your head down, thinking, I'm glad he loves me, but I just don't know if he can use me. Guys, don't waste your time. Get into your word. This is your chance to start planting yourself next to living water, and you will see fruit start to be produced in your life. I'm telling you, it'll just start to happen. It's a spiritual thing that only God can do through something this powerful, okay? We also have this thing called Right Now Media. You can get some great Bible teaching. And there's this, uh, there's, this, uh, there's this video, it's called, or this set of videos called, Now What Do I Do? Okay, again, if you're struggling with something, all you have to do is take this, check mark, I want to be a part of these, like I want the reading plan or or I want to watch this later, we will send you an email. Just put your name and your email on here. Drop it off in the back. There's this blue card where, these, uh, where there's uh, some baskets. You can drop your blue card off in there. We'll send it to you. We're trying to get all the obstacles out of the way so that you can get your nose in this beautiful book. Okay? But there's something else I want to do. 
But there's two groups of people in this room that I, I just, before we go, I, we, we, we need to make sure we address them. If you in particular are saying, I really am struggling with something, I can't seem to get over it, I keep falling for the same trap over and over again, I feel like I'm the one, like Peter, who doesn't deserve uh, the love of God, who doesn't deserve to be accepted by him or even used by him. If that's you, okay, I want to help you. Back in, the, back in the day, they used to do altar calls, okay? We're not going to make you do that. I gave a long pause to make you think I was good. Here's the deal. So many people are not going to come forward because they're like, yeah, I'm going to come forward and let the whole church know that I stink with sin. We're not going to make you do that. So here's what we're going to do. Could you stand, please? Okay, could you stand? Here in a moment, I just want to give you a chance. We're going to hand out a card to you, okay? But to do this with uh, a little bit of uh, anonymity, 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 yeah, that word. You know what I'm trying to say. What I'm going to have you guys do is actually bow your heads and close your eyes. Could you do this for me? So, listen, if you are someone who has really been struggling with your sin, and you feel like uh, God can't really use you, okay? Here's the deal. I want to talk to you personally. I want to meet with you. Maybe you need to confess, okay? Maybe you just need someone to know you're struggling through it, or maybe you're really just like, I don't know what to do next. I need help taking some next steps, okay? I want to meet with you. And so if that's you, if you're willing to meet with me, we're going to hand you a card right now, and I want you to raise your hand. Okay, if you, if you would like to talk to someone, if you would like to confess, if you're struggling with a lot of shame and guilt, I want you to raise your hand right now, and we're going to hand you a card as an invitation. Okay, just keep your hands up, we'll get to you. Okay, go ahead, keep your hands up. Because guys, God... Uh, God doesn't want you to just stay in your shame and in your guilt. He wants to restore you. And the church is here to help be a part of that. Okay? And I'm here to help with that. Okay? Now, at the same time, keep your heads down, there might be some people in here who are saying, you know what? I'm that guy or I'm that, I'm that, I'm that person that Jeff was talking about before where I am not, I'm not even sure if I'm a Christian. I don't know where I stand in my relationship with Jesus. You got to understand something. God doesn't expect you to fix yourself and then come to him. You come to him because he is the one who can restore. And so if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior with, yeah, that is your first step, okay? That's what you need to do right now. You need to tell him right now, Jesus, I am a sinner, and I need you to forgive me of my sins. I need a Savior. Go ahead and say that to him right now. Say to him right now, I, I recognize I can't live this life on my own. I need you. Would you be Lord of my life? Pray that right now. Receive the, the forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ in your life now. Now, if, if you prayed that prayer, again, everyone's eyes are closed. Would you raise your hand right now? If you prayed that prayer for the first time, We're going to hand you a card right now. Okay. Go ahead and keep your hands raised. We're going to hand you a card right now. This card is an invitation to you to be baptized. Okay. We don't get baptized so that, you know, so it's like this magical thing that it's, it's our ticket to heaven. Guys, we get baptized because God told us to do it. Okay, and if you haven't been baptized yet, like this is our this is your chance so you be united with Christ. So there's pins in front of you. Okay, we can all we can all look up now. If you receive this card, either this side or this side, okay, there's a pin in front of you. I'd love for you to just write down the best way to get a hold of you. Just write that down and we'll contact you. Okay? And then what you can do with this card is just leave it on your chair. We'll, we'll pick it up later. It's just a, a quiet and easy way 
for you to, uh, to for, for us to help you take some next steps. Okay? So, if you got one of these cards, fill it out, and we'll be in contact with you. Okay? Because we want to help. We want to help you find restoration in your sin. No longer do you have to come to your Father with your head bowed in shame. You get to be free. You get to be free. Let's worship Him. Now, real quick, if you're like, I missed my chance, I should have grabbed a card. It's not too late. We have some people at the end of the aisles over here who still have these cards. You can still grab it. But during this song, if you have a card, fill it out and leave it in your chair.